All right, just to confirm for my listeners who we got on the phone here, it is the one and only Will Coles. Is it you, sir? Yes, sir. How's it going, man? Oh, it's going all right, man. It's a long day. Finally trying to wind down a little. Um, <clears throat> got a bit of a frog in the throat, but that's probably because I smoke too much marijuana. Um, oh, yeah, I hear that. <laughs> it's a double-edged sword. Um, but, yeah, what's going on with you? Anything new, fun, or exciting before we dive into the interview? Uh Lots of stuff going on with the label. Uh, uh, we got a new release coming out June 11th from um, a young guy from Argentina called uh, Yatuza. Uh, so far, the promos are doing really well, so I'm really excited about that. That's awesome. What is this going to be coming out under? Um, our, our label, uh, Liquid and Gunshot. The EP is called uh, The Bad EP. The Bad EP, like the Michael Jackson song? Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> um, and you know why I asked that is because I know you're a part of Dungeon Crew, but I wasn't sure if that was what you released under or if the, is it Liquid Gunshot? Liquid and Gunshot Records, that's yeah, that's our label. That's Dungeon Crew's label. It's uh, run by myself and my brother and um, Sunil Gupta, who's a uh, guy that runs the plate special, mm -hmm. D&B Refined. Yes, he is actually uh, one of the best artists in the city. I have him working on some designs right now. And uh, Sunil is one of those people who's pulling a lot of strings behind the scene. And, and if you don't know who he is, you should look into it because the guy's contributed a lot more than people you do know. So, big up Sunil Gupta. Um, yeah, great guy, great guy. He is a great guy. Um, all right, let's, let, let's, let's dive into the interview. I'll ask you some fun questions, get to know you a little, then we'll dive into some industry ones, okay? Right on. Awesome. All right. What was the last song you were listening to before you spoke to me? Oh, shit. Um, just on the ride home. Uh, I think it would have been uh, Toast by Coffee. <laughs> I don't know who that is, and I'm sorry, but that's uh, funny. She's a, she's a wicked new reggae artist. Uh, cool. Like a young girl from Jamaica. I think she's like 17 years old. She's like really blowing up right now. If you haven't heard her, like, I definitely recommend checking her out. And her name is Coffee? Yep. Song is Toast? Yes, sir. Awesome. You know what? I can't help but chuckle. I think, you know, it's kind of what I had for breakfast this morning, and uh, <laughs> it's also an amazing <laughs> song and artist. I love it. Uh, what would you say was the first album you ever purchased with your own money? Uh, that would have been um, Snoop Dogg, uh, Doggy Style. What year is that? Like, 94? 94 I would have been like 12 interesting um have you been so you, did you grow up as a hip-hop fan before you got into the drum and bass stuff um, I listened to everything really growing up um a lot of hip-hop punk rock um in my teens I got heavy into reggae and it was mostly like dance hall was like the only thing I listened to um first time I heard drum and bass and jungle like I I was like at a buddy's house and he played me like a, a cassette of like some ragged jungle and I wasn't a fan. I was like, what the hell is this shit? It sounds like a bunch of like pots and pans and random reggae samples. Like, not for me. And then I think probably like 19-ish, I went to my first rave. And mm -hmm. like, you know how that goes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we know first how it goes. And, and I was hooked and that was it. That was it. And it was just jungle, jungle bass, jungle, jungle bass. Well, what was it then about Jungle that turned you on? Was it the rave or was it the people? Or was it the... Um, it obviously wasn't the music, I gotta say that. It was a combination of everything. Um, I had only heard Ragged Jungle at, at the time. So I think the party was, I think it was like Rocky and MCMC or somebody like that. I can't remember exactly. I think <clears> it was like a big ball party or something. And the actual drum and bass. Like I remember um, the team Drop Bear by Die. Like just got stuck in my head for like the like the next week. So it was a combination. Um, all right, let's go back a little then. If what what was your first concert before a rave? What was your first concert experience? Um, uh, it's a tough one, man. <laughs> you don't remember? No, I don't really remember. I know like my parents just, like take take me to a bunch of shows and shit when I was a kid. But I can't remember exactly what the first one would have been. Did you ever catch Sharon Lois and Bram live? No, no, unfortunately not. <laughs> <laughs> I am blessed that I could say I saw them. Uh, 
But yeah, you know what? But now that now that, now that I'm asking you the question, and I've asked many others, I'm trying to remember my first. Con- okay, I remember. I remember my first concert. I can't. I can't share it now though because I may be asked at a later date, and I don't want to spoil it. <laughs> yeah, I think like one of the like first ones I remember like going to like with like like myself and my friends was like like a punk rock show at uh, Lee's Palace. I can't remember who was playing, but yeah, that, like I, I used to go to like a lot of like the smaller like punk rock shows and around the city and shit. It's a great like, venue. Masonic, yeah, like Masonic Lodge type parties and like all those kind of like, venues and underground like punk rock shows. Well, that's what I was going to kind of say when you when you mention Lee's Palace. It's not going to be the Ramones, for instance. It's going to be, you know, some sort of either knockoff Ramones band or underground punk band. Um, yeah. Classic venue, though. That the the painting that's still on the walls there. You know, it's a staple in Toronto, is it not? Yeah, it's pretty cool. I actually think there's a master lapse on a party coming up there. I think uh, this week. I think it's the four year anniversary party. Pretty cool to see a drum and bass party there. I agree. I agree 100%. Uh, If you guys didn't catch that Master Lab this weekend, excuse me, I don't know if we're going to have this out on time for people to hear that, but um, maybe we can talk from the future and say, yo, that Master Lab party at Lee's Palace was awesome. (laughs) Um, All right, well, let me ask you this. Do you think as a DJ it's important for you to be a producer to be successful in today's industry? Uh, Yes and no. Um... I think maybe for us now, if we were to start out as just just DJs, yeah, it might be a little bit tougher to break into the scene, especially in Toronto right now because there's a lot of really good uh, producers coming out. And back then, like I don't know, you like it was different. Like uh, it wasn't as accessible. And, like me and my brother used to spend so much money on records and shit like that, or that like a lot of producers at the time wouldn't have have the same amount of money to drop on records so that kind of also made you stand out from the producers but nowadays yeah, it's like the music's so accessible that it's really tough to stand out as just a DJ how about vice versa do you think a producer must be a DJ to be successful uh well if they want to make money I mean money like, <laughs> that's part of success it's, I would think it's, it's, it's in gigging right it's like uh selling drum and bass records unless you're selling for like RAM and even then like you know you're not exactly breaking in the dough do you think that's changed over the years or is that a new phenomenon um I think it's definitely changed over the years I mean people aren't buying vinyl people are, aren't buying music at all it's you can go on any uh mp3 site now and, and pretty much download like the newest releases for free you know? A lot of the kids these days don't uh, have the same respect as we did back in the day, or, or or understand it like we couldn't do that shit back in the day because you actually had to buy vinyl. So yeah, that's interesting. Um, do you think that because of the I guess accessibility and how easy it is to release things nowadays, that maybe the quality of the things being created have gone down? Not overall, but just that there is more shit to sift through to find the diamonds in the rough, if you will. Hundred percent, man. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, fortunately, with like a few of the sites like Beatport and Juno, you know, they kind of kind of crack down a little bit. But yeah, it's seen a lot of shit that, that definitely wouldn't uh, see the day, like the, the site of day, if you had to put it on vinyl back in the day. Even with that, it's like, like I don't know if I'd be playing out as much music. Uh, as we are like a release a month if we had to like, actually press vinyl and then invest that much money into it. Why do you think that is then? Do you think that, for instance, you, your standard, your bar has been lowered because you don't have to go through the laborious process or even, let's say, the economics of pressing a dub plate? Therefore, you're willing to, like I say, lower the bar a little and play stuff out that maybe isn't at the standard it may have been 10 years ago? Uh, no, it's more so with like um, one of our last releases was from a, a new guy. It was his very first release. Uh, he's a 19 year old kid from Manchester named Visuals. And the music was like phenomenal, but taking a chance on somebody that's like never had a release before, it's like, I don't know, it's kind of tricky. And, and, and I don't know, like if you're familiar with like the drum bass scene, like a, it's not exactly the most financially booming scene, right? So taking any chances on anybody is a financial risk and definitely on somebody new. 
investing like um, even I think it's like uh, we're looking at pressing a hundred of uh, hundred test releases uh, recently, and I think you're looking at about three thousand pounds. Or so. <coughs> Excuse me, three thousand pounds or so just for that as well. So it's uh, for my Canadian listeners, that's about twenty thousand dollars. No, no, three <laughs> thousand pounds. Uh, yeah, it's about I'd say about seven or eight. I don't think it's that much, uh, to be honest. I think it's about 65. I think they're a little over 50, so it'd be around 65. Yeah. Um, but, yes, that is a lot of money for 100. Right? It's $65 a pop you're paying. Exactly. So, yeah, do the math. <laughs> well, that's, yeah, and that is a, a large investment. Like you say, uh, it's, uh, I guess, risk versus reward, and you got to always make a calculated risk when you do this. It's... But when you bet on somebody who's new to an industry, I almost think of like my first job waiting tables and Mm -hmm. I couldn't get one because I had never waited tables. Mm -hmm. You know, like I think every kid has been stuck in that point where you're trying to find your first job and no employer will hire you because you don't have a job record. And someone has to roll the dice, right? Yeah, and uh, it worked out very well for us. It's actually our best-selling release so far to date. Good for you, man. Um... Well, let me ask you this then. Like, let's take it back to the Dungeon Crew days. Like, what was the incentive in forming Dungeon Crew? Uh, we were just uh, a group of kids that always hung out together, um, and we also uh, DJing and MCing together at the same time. We all went to the same high school. Um, we hung out in a basement that everyone called the dungeon all the time because it was quite smoky down there, and we just. Uh, we, we're just like we decided like to, like we needed a name and like well we're always in the dungeon crew so let's just call ourselves the dungeon crew and, and the rest was there well and from what i know of dungeon crew you guys used to promote jams uh you weren't necessarily into the distribution or signing of artists that was where you started this new label am i right in saying that yes sir okay and when was the when was that started the new label actually we came up with the idea to launch actually last may so it's actually been um just last week um, would have marked one year. I think our first release dropped in July, or I think July or August. I kind of have to check again, but that was from, uh, from RMS. Nice. And to, hold on, let me just say this. To any of my fans, if you know RMS, please tell them to come on my show. <laughs> I hear, And I'll say this. The funny thing is about RMS is... I happened to MC a party out in Cambridge, and that was the first time I met him. And I was like, who's this RMS guy? And I haven't gone a day without hearing his name since. And he's a hard guy to get away from the computer, man. He's constantly in the studio. As you can tell from his output, the guy's one of the hardest workers in see, man. And talented. Talented, oh, man. Super talented. Super, super talented. Big up RMS. Um, I know I'll get him on the show one of these days. Uh, <laughs> all right, yeah, so I'll put, I'll put in a word, man. He's my homie. I appreciate that. Um, okay, so Liquid Gunshot was started in May of 2018. Um, it is where it is today. Is is it doing anything other than distroing and signing songs? Like, do you have a roster of artists, or is it just you and your brother? Yeah, yeah, no, no, yeah we've got a roster of artists. Who's uh, on the roster, please? Uh, visuals, the guy that we just mentioned. Um, the guy, Night Rider. Uh, RMS releases quite frequent with us. Uh, we have uh, Vital Elements, who's one half of Serial Killers. Nice. He's done a few releases for us. And and then we have a bunch of like one-off guys doing releases for us coming up. Well, and then you and your brother. You and your brother are producing together, right? Yeah. So, yeah, that's quite the extensive roster. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Can we expect to see any parties from the Dungeon Crew in uh, 2019? Yeah, yeah, man, we've we got a few things uh, coming up uh, right now, uh, just uh, locking, a, locking down a proper venue, uh, but yeah, we, we definitely are looking to do something around, uh, I think, August. Nice. I have to check uh, <clears throat> check with my, my uh, brother and confirm on that one, but yeah, we've got a couple things planned. And then, like, a few, like, you know, like, take the church takeovers and run D&D takeovers here and there. That's awesome. And as always, there will be links below to these guys if you want to follow them. Um, let me ask you this, and you've been in the scene for a long time. What changes have you noticed from the day you entered to where we are today? Uh, it's definitely got a little bit smaller. You're talking uh, Toronto itself, right? 
Yeah, Toronto itself. Um, like party wise, like you don't see the big like opera house jams anymore or as frequent. But uh, I don't know, still like lots of really great parties. Um, the music, well, music wise, like this, like back in the day, like uh, like when we were growing up, there's like maybe like six guys in the city that were like actually releasing music. Now there's like. Hmm. Uh, wrath of talent out there you know there's so many dudes that are just smashing it right now like uh new like decision um somatic polaris like all these new guys are just killing it you know what i one thing i want to say to that i don't know if you're familiar with the mix cd i did years ago it's called the vivids mix cd and yeah, man. you know what you know what i'm talking about so yeah man. the goal when i did that was to try and create a 100 percent toronto producer and mc album and uh, make it a radio-friendly style at the same time so it could be like appealing to hip-hop heads or even rock heads because it's got that four-minute song with a verse-chorus kind of structure to it. Um, yeah, man. Well, it was a really, really cool little album. Great concept as well. Thank you, buddy. Um, but I have to say that it was a lot of hard work back then. Like for me, and also the internet wasn't as easy as it is today. You couldn't just... You know, back then it was MSN Messenger more than Facebook, so the you couldn't just click a friend and then see his friends and then start scoping through, because now it's like once I have, for instance, Mompy Swift, let's say I can click Mompy Swift's friend list and there's all of the people we need to know, just start clicking them and sending the messages, right? Yeah. Um, so it's a lot easier now than it was, and also the abundancy that you speak of, and it's not an oversaturation. You, you mentioned some amazing artists, uh, Polaris, RMS. NC-17 just got signed to Ram Records. Um, well, he's, yeah, he's killing it right now. He's always been killing it. Though. I was going to say, he's always been killing it. It's just the world's starting to notice. Um, you know, Rene Levice was just here the other yeah, day, uh, yeah. putting Toronto on the map. But, um, yeah, it's it's definitely become an abundancy in Toronto that there's good music coming here. When you talk about the Opera House not being booked to throw parties, um, I don't know if we have the crowd to sustain it. Like when somebody said with Cyrus, what they did a couple years ago, and someone's like, they should yeah. do that shit every month. I'm like, nobody would yeah. come out if they did it. It would take the third month till the crowd dwindled away. Right? So you got to just yeah. pick your timing, throw the party at the right time, and you'll get that pop. But you can't do it every month like we used to, man. Well, the, the good, like, I, I don't know, like, for me at least, I actually enjoy going to the smaller parties, the more intimate parties. Because we're still getting, like, the same amount of headliners going through towns. It's just the parties are a little bit smaller, which I'm, I'm fine with as well. Yeah, it's more intimate, right? You get a cool experience. You know what we have? I won't say who. I've got some artists coming out um, later this year. And uh, <laughs> I shouldn't even say this, but I'm going to say fuck it. We've negotiated into the contract a third show. And the third show is just an intimate show that we're going to have them perform at my friend's house over dinner. And it's going to be an invite only to see one of these people like, well, you're having a nice dinner. Um, they did it recently with Mompy Swift. I don't know if you're familiar. He was here last week. And he did a little camping show on the Saturday. He did a big show on Friday where it was open yeah. to the public. And then Saturday they did a little private invite only at the campgrounds, which was cool, right? Yeah, man, that's super cool. Yeah, I've seen the videos. Let's see, you know what I'm talking about. Um, all right, let me ask you this. If you could create a Mount Rushmore for the jungle industry, what four faces would you put up there? Oh, that's tough because... There's four faces I know should be there, and then, like, you get, then is it, like, the four faces that you want there? Like, <laughs> you guys, like I know, like, there's a couple guys I've thrown in there that I know that there's somebody else that could be replaced by them. It's, it's a really hard question, but let's see. <laughs> Definitely Groove and Fab. Okay. Uh, next two are really, really tricky. And the thing I want to say as a sidebar is uh, I would think that Will is someone who's listened to my show and has heard this question, I'm, I'm sure, posed to other people. Um, okay. I like to think that it's one that when it's asked to others, people think, what would my answer be? You know, like, ooh, who would I put up? So to the listeners, well, think of your answer now because you might yeah, be stuck like Will. Definitely Mampy. Definitely Mampy for me. Oh, see, you're saying Mampy. Mampy. That was another yeah. thing we brought up. Is it Mompy or Mampy? And you're saying Mampy. So, <laughs> you're a Mampy guy then, eh? Yeah, I guess so. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, he was a dude that made me want to want to be a DJ and, and buy decks and stuff, so I definitely got to throw him on there. Oh, well, hold on a second. I saw your brother at the Mompy Jam. I did not see you. 
Yeah, no, unfortunately, I, I had uh, plans and I couldn't make it. Ah. Uh. Family. Just, was it the lady? Able to get out was of. it the lady or was it because your brother was there? So it couldn't have been too much of family. No, no, my brother was able to get out of it. I, I was actually uh, uh, house sitting for my parents and watching their cat. Seriously? <laughs> You wouldn't go out because you were watching your parents' cat? Yeah. That is horrible. <laughs> I, I leave for days and I leave the cats behind. Shit. I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting old, man. Like, That's what it is. Friday night parties, too, or like, I don't know, sometimes like get home from work. And like, yeah, I gotta go. And then get home and like, sit on the couch for a bit. And like, fuck it. No, I can. That what you just said, I can relate to. And I almost did it. Um, if it wasn't for the lady friend, I may have stayed in. Um but uh, well, yeah, said, Friday nights are tough. Lady friend may, may or may not have had a, a, a thing to do with it. <laughs> um, but okay, uh, so hold on. We got Fabio, we got Groove Rider, we got Mompy. We need one more. Andy, you gotta go. Gotta go throw Andy on there. He's such an icon, right? Sorry, Andy who? Andy C. Oh, Andy C. Okay, yes, I've heard of that man. Um, did you see <laughs> Andy C is going to be in Kitchener next week? Yeah, that's weird. Uh, uh, one of my buddies is super. He hasn't uh, been to a party in, in years. I've seen Andy in years. He's all excited. And I was explaining to him uh, how there's kind of like two different Andys now. Mm -hmm. You got like the Andy C, you got the festival Andy C. And then you got your Andy C, Andy C. And the festival Andy C, from what I've seen, like watching videos and some like that, stuff like that, like the EDC festival and all that stuff. It's not that the Andy C that we grew up with, you know what I mean? I understand. You brought up EDC. Um, I think there's validity that he probably played a different set at EDC than he would play um, at, for instance, I saw him at Rampage. It was pretty hardcore. Um, exactly. Or like, or any of his like Andy C live. Like, so XOYO. I'm sure this. Yeah, XOYO nights. Yeah. Um, going the fuck in. I get what you mean, but here's the thing. I think this party out there is going to be more up the lines because you've got a great drum and bass lineup. You've got NC17. You got Noisia. You got Andy C. Um, the dubstep lineup, I saw excisions in there. Um, well, uh, well the, the real cool thing about that, too, is that there's going to be a lot of kids that are going there for the dubstep. They're going to hear the, the fast dubstep for the first time, right? I hope they're not too high to know what they're hearing. <laughs> you know what? This is actually a sidebar comment I, I made about uh, Wemf years ago. It was, how fucked up are the bugs that are, you know, like the mosquitoes? Yeah, yeah. If they're sucking the blood of these kids that are that high, how fucked up are the bugs? You know, just a bunch of high mosquitoes flying around in Kitchener. Watch out. Um, all right, we got four there. Let's lie. Last question here. Have some fun with this one. Uh, right. If you could put five items in a vault that would encapsulate our rave culture, what five items would you put? Definitely a, a technique. Just 1200. Okay. A piece of vinyl, I guess. A piece? Uh, hold on, hold on. A piece of vinyl? So like no record, just some vinyl like scrap. I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm not playing my, like my my records and normals, right? So. Oh okay. <laughs> You're keeping those. I say put in a copy of Pulp Fiction. That was the first ever Jungle song I heard. Yeah. It was yeah. Okay yeah yeah yeah. I'm throwing a repress for Pulp Fiction I guess for you. Thank you. <laughs> um, fuck. The glow stick. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh fuck! I don't know. I, wanna, I, wanna, I don't want to say like fucking ecstasy because it's fucking. I don't know. I'm not really like, a big fan of the drugs in our in our scene, the drug culture part of our scene. Can we not admit that it is a part of our culture? It is a huge fucking part of our culture. <laughs> I like ecstasy. I don't like it nowadays, but I did it when I was a kid. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard it was pretty cool. I heard it was pretty cool. <laughs> I heard that stuff is neat. Um, yeah, and I always, whenever, and we've had some big guys mention ecstasy. Most recently, Terry T of Knowledge and Wisdom said ecstasy, and he even had Love Dove as his favorite pill. Um, yeah. So, yeah, like, it's it's not what it was. It's scary nowadays what you're going to put in your body. But, um, yeah, drugs are definitely an aspect of them, so I'm, I'm with you there. 
So I think we've got four items. We've got a, yeah, four items. We've got a technique, a vinyl, a glow stick, and some drugs. And maybe like some fucking big baggy ass like pussy fucking sweatshirt or something. Say it again. A big baggy ass sweaty sh- sweatshirt. No, 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 the brand Stussy. Oh, stuff. Oh, is see, I that's new age to me. I don't know them. I've seen the signature on people's hats and stuff. And yes, I guess it is popular in. Is it popular in the rave or is it just popular in like hip hop and pop culture? Yeah, I, I think it's pretty pop, 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 popular in the, in the drum and bass scene. Actually, I'm going to change my, my answer now and though to uh, actually a dub plate special t shirt. There, yeah. I was going to say even snug, but dub plate special with Sunil being a part of you guys. Come on. Yeah, yeah. I got I to gotta rip my, my boy. So, yeah, dub plate <laughs> special t shirt for sure. There we go. And you know what? I've been asking him to get me some gear. I have throwback. Old school dub plate special gear. I only have a sweater left, or sorry, a jacket. But I want to get my hands on some of that uh, D&B oh, refined. Buddy. You got to see some of the shit I got. I got a whole bunch of like one-off things. It's no, like, no made for, like, for himself when he was a kid. Like weird like football jerseys and like, like weird looking like FUBU kind of track suits that they got the dub plate special on somehow. That's awesome. Well, that's all. It's, you know what? They, they got the Dubplate special on there because they probably got the bootleg line from China or something and, and put their yeah, logo. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So it's got the link on that. <clears throat> you know, we used to sell. There was a place I worked at down, downtown called Rockwell, uh, Dundas and yeah, Bond. Yeah, I remember that place, man. I used to shop there all the time. It's all bootleg. It's not yeah, real, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. I bought a like, fucking. Oh, you think I didn't know that my fucking uh, Gucci velour suit I bought was <laughs> bootleg? Right, for like 80 bucks because it was on sale? <laughs> yeah. Everything's on sale at Rockwell. <laughs> but I remember, and he used to play so dumb. The guy's name's Steve Rockwell. But when you would ask him, like, Steve, you know this shit's bootleg? He'd be like, no. Because he knew that by admitting it, he could get in a lot of shit, right? But yeah. all of the people that would sell them would come in, and they were Chinese guys. And they would sell, you know, Peli Peli, Fat Farm, Sean John. Remember the, uh, the Playboy shit for a while, too? Yeah, well, to be honest, that's after. I do remember that, yeah. But that was after me. I worked there when I was... 14. As a matter of fact, that's how I met Caddy Cat. Was Thanks. I was working at that store and he came in and he was looking at one of the shirts and he said, How much for that shirt? And I went, For you? And he went, What do you mean for me? And I went, Well, you're Caddy Cat. And he went, Oh, you know who I am. And I'm like, Yeah, man, I'm a jungleist. I, I know you. And uh, yeah, that was my introduction to meeting Caddy on a personal level, I guess. I already knew him as a musician, obviously. Um, yeah. But yeah, I guess big up Steve Rockwell, and, and I think everybody knows what they're buying when they go in that place, right? Yeah, man, yeah, man. You gotta be a fucking idiot. <laughs> no, don't say that, because there's going to be somebody watching this going, Fuck you! I'm not an idiot! <laughs> That's a real fucking snakeskin fool who she was about. <laughs> yeah, fuck you! <laughs> oh, man. All right, I'm going to sign off to the listeners, but I want to talk to you, so stay on the phone with me, okay, buddy? Yeah, man. All right, guys, uh, as always, I hope you enjoy listening as much as I enjoy talking to these guys. Uh, there will be links below, so check them out. Dungeon Crew, Liquid Gunshot. Am I saying that right, Will? Yeah, buddy. Awesome. Um, as always, thanks for tuning in, and until next time, peace out.